have a great show tonight. Really excited. But I want to jump right in and introduce our first guest because if you haven't heard, this week Coda finished up the a major resurface out there at the track, and we have Leo Garcia, the Coda's VP of Facilities and Track Operations, on the show. Leo, welcome to Speed City. Hi, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. I guess you get to get some rest now. <laughs> no, it's not over. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, Leo, thank you very much for coming on. We really appreciate it. I know you guys talked to a lot of press this week about it, but uh, having you on here for us is really a privilege, and we thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, why don't you start off and just give us an overview of exactly what happened with this track resurface? So basically what we started out was uh, Texas A&M reached out to us. We've been working with them for a long time and volunteered some of their services. So Texas A&M has a transportation and pavement institute where they get involved working with TxDOT. And since, in, and since they work with TxDOT in the area, we figured they would be an ideal partner to help us evaluate some of the issues that we may be having. So they came on site. Basically, first step was to uh, take all the data that we had from the soil and the, um, I'm sorry, from the asphalt. We sent it to them for review to see if there's any, any advice that they would give the installation company or the paving company of maybe adjusting to polymers, maybe any, anything that may have to do with the weather and the installation process. They came on site and brought a couple of pieces of equipment, uh, ground penetration radar, some LIDAR. They did some 3D mapping on the track. And then they used the ground penetration radar to look at multiple areas throughout the track that we feel might have had some anomalies that would have caused some of the issues. So at turn 10, it was very evident for us. What we found was that uh, there was a piece of conduit that was running across the track that didn't show up on our prints. Uh, so then we we did some excavations and we realized that there was a piece of conduit that was probably flexing at turn 10 that caused uh, some of that indentations there. So that was kind of an easy fix. But turn two was probably the bigger problem because nothing on the print showed what was underneath the ground. So the ground penetration radar probably went about three or four feet deep, didn't show anything, didn't um, indicate there was any weakness in the soil. And so then we did some some digging in a couple of different spots and we determined that it was actually pretty dry. So then we were, the next phase was like, so what do we do about it? So they suggested we reinforce the, the, the foundation, which is honest, you know, road base. So what we've done is we came in there and added about 10 inches of concrete, reinforced concrete, reinforced rebar, and created our own zone of compactation at turns two. And we went, did the same thing at turn 10. So we think that those two changes that we made will allow us to keep those indentations uh, from coming back up. Plus it allows us to, if we had to kind of create our own environment where if we had to come back and mill, instead of being right at the turn where the driver was leaning into in, at the apex, it allows us to now have, you know, if, if the concrete does float, it's away from the turn that we, if we had to come in and mill, it wasn't going to be in an area where it was going to affect the driver. After that, basically, uh, the company came in and did the paving. Uh, they, they had already done the milling, and they'll use you know, GPS systems, what they call profiling, and create to make sure the track was smooth. Even though there's indentations all over the place, uh, we cut the track smooth. So then they'll come in and pave over it. It's a special mix. It's not a mix that you find anywhere. Uh, it has to be made, different polymers, different rock sizes. So the contractor typically has to change the, the machines that cut the rock to make it smaller for us, so it's a big process. The, the, the mix uses different polymers, different hardeners, and it's not something that, um, you know, you just go down there and they just pave. So they didn't work with us, found the great days that were gonna be the warmest, which was something recommended by Texas a to make sure we find the days. So we paved, 12 through 15 first, uh, basically one day because it was a short run. We're able to do that. And I think the transition at 12 all the way through, it's it's amazing. It's super smooth. Uh, we've done a couple of tests on it and, and one of the cars. And we think the transition that, and the way everything flows, it's, it's, it's a massive, massive improvement. Uh, we did a little bit of work at 12 because we got some complaints of different levels as the cars were coming across at the apex at 12. So we milled that back, 
two inches, leveled everything out, then repaved on top of that. And again, that transition, I think, is it's almost seamless now. Uh, from there, we picked a couple more days where they were going to come in and do some work at uh, 2 through um, 10. So we did the first run all the way to about 7, 6 or 7. We stopped there, and then we started the following day. Luckily, we had great weather, closer to the 70s, 74, 75 on one day, which allowed the mix to uh, kind of stay hot. So when they started working on the compactation, they were able to kind of get on get on it pretty quick and and just stay on it throughout the day. And so then, I think those transitions also from from ten, I mean two all the way to ten now, are in great shape. It's super smooth, especially the S's. That's probably hasn't been that smooth obviously since probably since installation. Uh, so I think it's going to make the track super fast, super safe. I think the drivers are going to be more aggressive there, and we'll see some of that speed carry through through that area. Wow. Well, Leo, uh, that's, that's really amazing because I'm very familiar with the Texas A&M Transportation Institute. They, they get quoted uh, by the national government. They're, they're yeah. one of the foremost transportation experts in the United States. And uh, the fact that you guys have thought of all of these things and all the technology you're using, I mean, it's befitting of the, you know, the circuit here in the United States that's for the pinnacle of motorsports that is Formula One to have the pinnacle of, of transportation consultants. And it sounds like you guys have, uh, have, have thought of everything. They were great. Uh, they were great to work with. They came in on site with all their equipment, uh, very personable people. I, I really pre- appreciate their, their professionalism and just kind of laid back approach to helping us. They offered it from the get go. They said they were here to help. Uh, and so they did, uh, they reviewed the asphalt mix that we had. We sent them all the technical data, what we had from our records plus the contractor sent to the data. They pretty much said that everything was right on. They reviewed the the samples. They reviewed all the data that of the mix that was made live was sent to them for them to review. They basically said they don't think there's anything wrong with the mix. They don't think there's anything wrong with the design of it because it is based off the original design by Tilkey. Um, you know, there's been some variations. Obviously, the the quarry where they get the rocks from no longer it's been 12 years deep so the rocks may be different so there's little variables that we kind of think about or we don't think about uh they just felt everything was fine with the ground penetration radar they made some comments in a couple of different areas but nothing that showed that there was separation or the road base was falling apart i don't know if people realize but there's a liner underneath the track when it was built and there's 15 low what we call low point drains and so every day the track team, that's what they do. They go, they set the low point, the low point drains and then pump the water out. The liners in place, number one, to keep the water from, from around the area to come up into the track. And then it's got the drain so that way the water that does come onto, we're able to pump out. And we do that daily. So it's a it's a it's just a maintenance program that we have in place that was kind of designed from Tilking. But Texas AM, you know, from the ground penetration radar to the LIDAR. 3D mapping has given us a couple of points where we know we're going to have to come back and mill at some point because we see a little bit of already uh, of the changes, but it's minimal. Uh, in this case, I'm hoping that the contra- the concrete uh, foundation that we came back and took the road base out, poured concrete. Uh, hopefully those those areas are going to be exactly what we need to keep that, that area flat for a much longer period of time. Leo, i got to ask because um, I've done both two-wheel and four-wheel and you're up against it when you're dealing with both Formula One and MotoGP because they're so, they're so different in terms of their requirements. And then you've got NASCAR, which is another different requirement, if you will. Um, so it's not easy to please everyone. But the main reason, obviously, the bikes are the most uh, precarious because there's a body hanging off it. Uh, and I just wondered how much um, crossover between, I think it's, Franco Ancini, who basically gathered together the thoughts of the riders after last time they came, and there was obviously a lot of complaints um, because of those big bumps at, at the places you mentioned. So will MotoGP come here before and sort of, if you like, you know, tick, tick the work you've done or, 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 or kind of say, yeah, that, 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 that's fine? Or, or how does it work? So Franco and I have become, you know, pretty good friends. We talk over the stand. Uh, of the year and for the last two three years that I've been so we communicate regularly so I keep them up to date and typically I'll, I'll create a report and show them everything we've done you know obviously they're very demanding and there is a different level of expectations as far as how smooth the track is 
And so then it doesn't obviously translate to the cars. Cars are a little bit more aggressive. They can cover more ground. And, you know, when I, when you asked me, we're pretty much done. And the reason I said we weren't done is because now we have some transitions that we have to work out. There are some areas on the rumble strips meet the new asphalt that just don't line up exactly. So we'll have to come back and make some adjustments to some of that, some of those areas. And so that's the next phase that we're working on. But before we get ahead of ourselves, we also want Franco to come on site and drive around the track and just kind of get a feel for the things that we've already done. So I kept him posted pretty regularly uh, along with the with Bill Combo at the AMA. I'm putting up an email packet together so I can send to the FIA. Additionally, uh, Tony Cotman that's here in the States, uh, he works for the FIA. He's kind of like the local guy. Uh, so I'll send him in some information, invite him over to come and take a look at it. Uh, I mean, I can attest that the track looks amazing. It's super smooth. The work that the guys did and we put, to, you know, everything we put together, I think it's going to be very effective. I mean, the S's haven't been done, redone since obviously since the beginning and we've milled it a couple times. So those bumps are, are kind of there for a while, but now it's it's really smooth. I had to slow the car down that I was driving because I, I couldn't I couldn't stick to the ground. It's <laughs> just it just transitioned so fast now that that uh, I think it, they're going to be some adjustments. I think how fast they go into the area that they can kind of carry the speed. Uh, but I think the riders and the drivers are going to be pretty happy with it. Well, there's one thing that uh, you'll know all too well, but many people in the audience may not know that when Formula One goes to a track. Such is the forces of braking that they, they are, it's well known that they ripple corners up, especially going into somewhere like 12. So they'll almost push the surface of the tarmac forward. And of course, that's a worse nightmare for a, a motorcycle rider because he's basically going off what almost are like mini whoops in motocross. It, has there been any technology or is there, is there anything you can do about what is just an, an innate problem when you have both Formula One and MotoGP at one place? So that's why the design of the asphalt is different. The asphalt, if you read the rule book, the rule ba book basically says you're supposed to use new and modern day materials. And so then if you sit, sit down and think about it, who uses new and modern day materials is highways. Right? So the highways can handle the load, they can handle the speed, but none of it can handle the acceleration, the braking, the lateral Gs that are forced upon it. So that's why the mix that we use is different. It uses different polymers, it's harder, the rocks are smaller, it creates more area for everything to, to mesh together. And that's why we use the mix that we use, even though the rules say, just do whatever. Whatever's new and modern is your, what you can do. But we all know that that's not going to work. And so that's why the mix that we use is specifically designed to withstand the lateral, the braking, additionally the speed, and then obviously the weight of the vehicles because of the downforce. So it's not a run-of-the-mill uh, asphalt that you just kind of throw on the highway by no means. And that's why... It's an expensive adventure to do this work at the level that has to be done as opposed to just going and paving your parking lot. Leo, I got a question for you. you you've pinged most of my questions already, but there's one sure. that's still out there. Uh, traction. Uh, I, I was on Texas World Speedway right after they repaved it and everything, and, and they'll call it a very green surface or a very green track. Yeah. And I'll say it took a lot for the track to to wear in or to not have that green service and really have the traction build up. How will you prepare for MotoGP guys coming here? I know there are well, some track day weekends and things of that, but is there anything to, to prep it otherwise? No, typically we'll just run the cars. The cars will over time will kind of wear it, wear, wear uh, you know, some of that oil off, kind of create some of that roughness that, that will happen. That's the advantage of our track is, how often we use it, it allows us to see and work it differently than some other tracks that you pave and you have to wait for the race. So I think that we have, you know, it goes hot on the 28th or 29th, which we'll start getting feedback from the drivers and, and how the cars, but obviously they'll have to be aware that it's going to be kind of slick in some of the areas because some of the buildup. We'll typically clean it. We may run some oil dry on it, depending on, on where we go. We might use some limestone powder to kind of get it in there, kind of help dry things up. So it just depends on what happens in the next several days and any recommendations that the depart that the uh, the contractor has for that. Uh, so I think the the racing and in any recommendations, which typically last time last year what we did is we threw some limestone down, but it's only because we had a hot track within days of paving. Here we've we're, we're already, we've been done since Wednesday. 
So we've got this weekend, all of this next week, we got to do some work. We'll run some cars. We'll run the sweeper. Uh, so I think, uh, I think we'll be, we'll be pretty close to being ready by the time the track goes hot this weekend, but I'm figuring after a couple of laps and the cars on the track, then I think we should be, we should be in good shape. All right. Definitely by the time I've got for you Moto is, gets here. I remember that, uh, when I was first out at Coda, I, I was one of the lucky few that got to go around when it was dug down in the ditch. Uh, yeah. Al Mays took me for a ride <laughs> that time. But uh, one of the things that was really amazing was how much water the track surface could shed. Will all of this work change any of that? I mean, it was like inches an hour that it could shed. No, nothing's changed any of that. The French drain and the conduits and everything that's in place is there we we won't touch any of it unless there's a a concrete rumble strip that's that that doesn't mesh up as close to as we need it we may have to do some work and, and if that happens then we'll get into the conduit but beyond that none of the conduit's been touched in those areas that we're working right now everything's still in place we worked within the track limits because the conduit for the french drain it's typically either in concrete or a different asphalt the only part of the track that has the racing asphalt is between the white lines. So if we had to do anything like that, that repairs pretty quick and we could bring in a contractor to, to fix any of that. But no, we haven't, we, we haven't touched any of it in these zones, so we don't anticipate any issues. Mm. Uh, Leo, let me just That's ask amazing. you, just to, be, just to be clear. So uh, you were talking about 2 through 10. You said 2 through 7. So, are you, are you, so 2 through 10, the entire strip, that all those current turns were done? Correct. So we went, I mean, we've had already paved from the bottom of one all the way through the other side of two, almost getting to the first bridge, but that's where the bump came back. And so then this time around, what we did is we, we started up at the, between one and two, we, we ripped all that out and right there where the, where the bump was, where the indentation was, is we poured concrete. And then from there, it literally goes from the middle of one and two all the way through almost turn 11, probably about the 100, and, the 100 foot marker, I think, the 100 meter marker, break marker, all the way to there, which is just, I mean, very close to, to turn 11. And then again, we started at 12, we came back from 12, went all the way back to where we initially cut it, which is probably at the 50 foot marker, 50 meter marker, all the way through, the turn 16 where where the new asphalt started the last go around two years ago we intercepted that area so it's it's basically two all the way through 16 where it picks off from the repairs that were made two years ago what would you guess or do you know what percentage of the entire i mean you it sounds like a lot of the track what would you guess percentage wise i would say almost 90 percent of the track's been repaved in the last two years the section from just basically the hairpin at 11 and then the front straight basically from uh just past the apex of 19 all the way through the bottom of the hill at turn one is is the old stuff mm -hmm. i would say about 90 a little bit over 90 percent of the track's been repaved leo i just got one real quick one but just give our audience perhaps some of our international uh, fans uh, a sense of just how the weather in texas living here you understand it um, but maybe some of the guys who are coming from MotoGP or Formula One don't understand what happened in 2015 and just how heavy weather in Texas can be. Yeah, I mean, that's been a tough, a tough situation for us because we've had floods in the area, two floods that were supposed to be five to 600 or a thousand year floods. In 2015, we had this massive flood that it rained during obviously the F1 race. But a lot of people don't realize that shortly after the F1 race is when we got inundated, where the tire deck was flooded. We had tons of water, tons of damage, millions and millions of dollars of damage to the facility, to the track. Uh, and I mean, it was to the point where the canopies at the main grandstand were completely shredded. Uh, we have video of a modular unit, one of our mods that we use for office space, literally being picked up and tossed over the Armco and Tech Pro. Uh, it was a substantial, substantial massive storm that brought in tons of water that flooded both tunnels all the way through the medical center into the event center, the first floor of all the garages, probably six to eight inches was completely flood flooded. And so it was massive. It was a massive amount of water that the property, you know, 
can't manage because we're not designed to, to, to deal with that. So then you had that massive flood, which we believe ex accelerated a lot of the problems that we're having on the track because, you know, we are not a complete solid foundation area, although we do have a lot of rock. In some of the areas, some of the other areas does have a lot of soil that's very pliable. And so then that accelerated a lot of the problems that we started having early on because right after 15 is when we started having a lot of the problems on the track, a lot of the movement. And then we also had this massive freeze about a year ago uh, that we believe that where's where we noticed we did. And we noticed that the bump at or the indentation at 13, the one at 10 wasn't very, very evident. Uh, but Richard, one of the guys that worked for us who's on the track every day, knows it like the back of his hand. He's the one that brought to attention. It's like, hey, man, it looks like at 13, there's an indentation that wasn't there. And it was like weeks and weeks after the winter storm that we started to notice it. Uh, but one of the things that we didn't notice before MotoGP got here was the bump at 10. It's really not even a bump, guys. It's really an indentation because there's a conduit that was there that was creating a void. And so it was sinking or shaking and moving, and the asphalt actually created a dip. And so we think those two big factors obviously contributed to the movement of the track. And then we, we feel that it's going to, we as a company have acknowledged that that is something that's probably what we're going to have to be dealing with for years to come. We just have to prepare. And every time we open the ground up, we need to do some kind of reinforcement to make sure that we're taking the necessary steps before we pave over it. Um, so, I mean, that's that's the point or that's the stance that we have is that we know that something's gonna happen. You know, it's, it's hard for us because, you know, we have other track rentals. You know, we're also part of the community. We do a lot of things around the area that try to make sure that we're a good partner. And sometimes it gets frustrating for us to hear the negativity about the track, the track, the track. I mean, it's not all that we do here. You know, we, as CODA, we try to do a lot of different events that we try to be a part of the community. So sometimes when we hear all this social media stuff, the track and all these complainings and stuff, it's, it's difficult for us to hear when we know we're trying and there's some things that are out of our control. We can't anticipate when things are going to shift, when the rain's coming, when it's going to get so hot that it dries everything up. And, a pop, you know, people don't realize that our buildings are moving and so it's just not the track. It's the entire property that I have to deal with in preparation from a door can open to a fire riser room. And that's a city violation. And so it's a constant battle for us. We're always trying to fight this problem that it's not just the track. It's the entire property. It's the entire community. Leo, the entire town. Quite entire honestly. town. Yeah. Yes, sir. Leo, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. Yes, I wish we had about another hour to talk about this. This is really amazing. And Thank you guys for doing what you did. That's uh, and it sounds like you did it exactly what it was needs to be done. So, thank you very much, and thank you for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks guys. Appreciate it. See you soon. Okay, see you. See you at the track. Bye.